Okay, for the record, we're interviewing Judge Herbert Cage for the Midlow Center on August 3rd, 2016. Judge, you consent to this interview? Yes, I do. Can you tell us your full name? Herbert Middle Initial A, Cade, C A D E. What's A for? Adolf. <laughs> Adolf, okay. <laughs> That's why I didn't give it. During that. World War II? I was born in 1944, <laughs> yes. Well, you remember Jill Oakson? I'm sorry? You remember Jill oh, yeah. Oakson? He Dr. mentioned Lark. his half brother was born in 1942, and his stepfather, who was a staunch Nazi, named him Adolf Hitler, <laughs> but the nuns refused to register the Hitler part of the day. I understand but that. But he was irate. As I understand my story, uh, it was my godfather's first name. Okay. And he was not a Nazi. He was not a Nazi. <laughs> Interesting name. Where were you born? New Orleans, Louisiana. Okay. Uptown, downtown? Up, uptown. You were born uptown? 2415 South Galvis is where I okay. lived until my father got killed in a car accident. So when did you move downtown? Uh, December of 1952 to Mandeville Street, uh, which is actually the 8th Ward. Right. Two blocks off of Religion Fields. So where did you go to school? Valina C. Jones, Rivers Fredericks, St. Augustine's High School. Okay, what was it like when you were going to high school? That's an interesting story. High school was great. I mean, and Jordan and I had been downtown, um, obviously since at that point, eighth grade, and so I had been there a few years and had become a custom. And surprisingly, uh, at least three guys from my classes at Jones Rivers Fredericks were also in my class at St. Aug. Okay. Well, Jones was a great school. Was, was uh, Savannah Williams still? Not Savannah. What was her name? Uh, it's Williams' his first name. And I won in Fantasy. Fantasy Williams. Right. Was she still principal when you were there? Oh, yeah, she was principal. Okay. Was it had a great history. Yes. Did anything that you learned at either Jones or at St. Oak have an impact upon your later career? Well, I think it all did. Initially, I went to F.P. Rickard when I was uptown. Right. Um, a lot of, and I don't know if they had some sort of system, but a lot of the folks in my class at Valina C. Jones and Fredericks and St. Aug went on to finish college and get graduate degrees and some PhDs, some females that were in that class uh, became PhDs. Right. So, I mean, you had some people you'd call role models at any of those schools that had Well, I think all of the teachers were uh, in a sense that I guess at home we understood there was consequences for inappropriate behavior. Right. Uh, and the same at school, and for the most part we really didn't have that problem. Okay. Um, you know, kids will be kids, but it wasn't the kind of thing of what I see on television today in terms of bullying and that kind of stuff. Right, it wasn't tolerated. No, it wasn't tolerated at all. So what kind of work did your parents do? Well. <laughs> My father, and in a sense I'm very lucky I had two fathers, my father was Fat Domino's manager and he owned a bar. Okay. He where? Uptown on Jackson and South of Durban. I know where he is. It was a club rocket. A lot of the local musicians, and I remember, I'm only eight years old, so my stories are what people told me. But he got killed in a car accident with Fat, Do uh, Fat Domino, bringing him to a, uh, a gig. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, then, you know, at, at, at that time, I kind of met a new fat, and there were other Smiley Lewis and some other folks. But that part of my life was just really history by the time I moved downtown. My mom, I would think, and I don't know this for sure, it may have initially worked as a domestic, mm -hmm. and then worked in cleaners, and ultimately had her own cleaning outlets okay. in the CBD, C&D cleaners it was called. And you said you had another father, your stepfather. My stepfather, who was not educated. Mm -hmm. Not formally, but not for, well, worldly educated. Oh, brilliant. But, and you begin to learn the difference between ignorance and stupidity. Mm -hmm. When he first came into the house, he would ask me to read stuff from the paper and that kind of stuff. And my initial reaction was, boy, is he a dummy. Hmm. Boy, was I wrong. Yeah. You know, he was... Uh, very smart guy, uh, very natural talent, 
you know, when I became a lawyer and putting the toys together for my kids, I had all the directions and <laughs> couldn't do it. Right. And he said, well, give me that. And that's my first thought would be, you can't read the directions. Uh, he did it quickly. Right. <laughs> you know, so you learn, I learned a lot from him. Okay. And he was from, initially from Edgar, Louisiana. Ah, a lady of grace, Pat. Yes, that's correct. You go up there often? Not anymore. I still have some relatives there, but you know things change, and they've moved on. So no, I don't. The food up there hasn't changed. No, no. That was one thing I remember about the River Road. Right, and then my mom's family was from Saint. My, my mom's family was from Saint Tammany, by Bonfica and Slidell. Yeah. My dad's family was from uh, Saint Tammany, but Mandeville, pretty much. Okay. So you grew up in the eighth ward, just on the yes. periphery of the seventh ward, two blocks away. So that basically was your stomping ground, as you used to call it at that time. Right, as a kid, pretty much, yes. So when you were going to St. Louis, did you walk through the neighborhood, or did you caught a bus, you had a ride, or what? I walked. You walked, okay. Right. Which and was what, not a little less than a, than a mile. It's about it's about a mile away. And I often pass by St. Aug. Now, there are far more cars oh, Lord, yeah. around St. Aug than Absolutely. ever for the four years I was there. Yeah. Now, no. Some kids have cars. I think we had, may have had one or two people hit a car in our class, but no, I walked. So what was it like at St. Aug? Well, it was great, again. Uh, clearly, there were consequences for inappropriate behavior. Yes. Uh, with our class, you know, studying and working, of course, I, I'll tell you the story, and I'll name quickly Skid Row. This mm -hmm. is my class. Uh, Gilbert Augustine died early on. Paul Bouye, I know yeah. you know who that is. Right. I Lambert, thought Paul was in 63. 61. Okay. Lambert Boissier, and this is alphabetical. Lambert Boissier, Hank Braden, uh, Herbert K. Dennis Donnell. Okay. And for whatever reason, we were dubbed Skid Row. Hmm. I'm not sure why uh, other people may have a, a different take. Maybe they thought we hung out and didn't study that much. I don't hmm. know. Dennis came here. You came here. Um, yeah. From that class, let me think. I'm not sure if others came here. I don't remember offhand. Paul went to Xavier. Yeah. Uh, Hank went out of state. He came here one summer. Okay. Because he was surprised that... How well we liked this little school, Gertis. Oh, Gertis. Lewis, of course. I'm sorry. Yeah. Lewis was in our, I'm sorry. I left Lewis out, yeah. and, I, and that's where I first started practicing law. Lewis came here and finished from here. Right. Right. And uh, was Michael Stokes? In Michael your Stokes was in our class. He was there for the last year. That's correct. Right. Okay. And when I when I'm talking about cl classroom, how about Charles Cotton? Charles was in our class, not the same classroom. Yes, but he was here. All of them came to UNO. That's right. That's correct. So who would you say uh, was some of the people that turned out who had the most influence on your later career? Well, I, I'm not so sure about the later career, just my way through life. Um, I always talk about, you know, I can't step on anybody's grass yeah. because that's saying all that was prohibited. And, Father Mac Man is Everybody has Father Mac on his list. <laughs> Every single person has Father Mac. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Father McManus, Father Rhett, Father Rook. I mean, those guys were, were in in your life on a daily basis. Quickly, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, I was sent to the principal to be paddled by Mr. Davis, the only lay teacher that I remember having there. And I went in and gave my first uh, opening and closing argument. I said, Father, I didn't do anything wrong. He has me wrong. And, you know, I should not be punished because I did nothing wrong. He says, Mr. Cade, I believe you. Bend over. <laughs> In this school, the teacher is always right. Ah. I mean, I, I understood that. And it didn't make you any worse a person? No. No. But Father McManus was more than a classroom teacher. He was. He was also a civil, and, and a civil rights, and he was truly involved with the civil rights at the time. And you know what tell us, if you don't come and somebody calls you the N-word, don't come complaining to me. Yeah. And we understood that. I remember he worked on voter registration. He's the one who got us involved in Pickerton on Canal Street because they had an agreement with the merchants that they were going to hire so many people, and they reneged. Right. And he told us, kind of sicked us on the merchants. Uh, also taught me how to fill out the voter registration form, sure. Sure. which was very important. 
you know, there's another priest, Father Berrigan, who... Okay. That's the other person that always comes up. Right. And it's funny, I did not know his... Obviously, he and his brother were very much involved. Right, his brother was a Jesuit. That's correct. And his brother just died not I didn't know that. Yet. He just died not very long ago. So is he still living? No, Father Phil Berrigan died okay. some years ago. Okay, and his brother just died. Wow, well, just he died. must have been pretty old. Yeah, and I think his name was Daniel. Daniel, Daniel Berrigan. and Philip Berrigan. I tried. Uh, yeah, he had to have been. I don't know. I assume he was the younger of the two, but I don't know that for a fact. I think Father Barnes is still living. Father Barnes? Yeah. I don't think he didn't teach me. No, but he, he left. He later got married and went back to uh, Kentucky. Okay, okay. Uh, I think he is one of the few who is still living from that Sixes group. Well, I don't, rem I don't know any of my teachers that are still living. There was an employee at St. Oh, Mr. Day, Jimmy Day, yeah. who died recently. Okay. okay, but I know the NAHB honored the Joseph Fighter Order in the mid-60s, and okay. there must have been about 15 of them who came down who were still here. Right. I, I hadn't seen Father Rook in a long time. Every now and then I'd run into Father McManus at some place like Eddie's or uh, right. some other place. Well, but, Father Rook would come to town when we had various functions. Um, but of course he passed some right. time ago too. And I think Father Keenan may have been the longest liver in, who remained here, and he was at Epiphany, and so okay. he too has passed. Are there any priests still left at the school? I don't know. Um, Probably a chaplain, I would guess. That, that's about it. It's, you know, it's a totally different situation. It's still a Josephite school, but to what extent they're involved, I really don't know. Right. Oh, and Father Ricard, who used to be over at, he's there. Is well, he there now? No. Nah, wait, wait, wait. It must be one of the young ones because the other one was became a bishop, a auxiliary bishop in D.C. Okay, no, this one is young. Okay. No. <clears throat> If I'm not mistaken, but to what extent he's involved in St. Augustine, I really don't know. Okay. Um, so, after you left St. Augustine, you came here. Yes. What was that like? Well, uh, no, we're talking 1961, the first time I had ever been. We had white teachers that were priests, but, and, you know, it, it was different uh, in the sense that I had never gone to school with whites. Right. Uh, and then there were women too. We right. didn't have that in, in high school. Uh, and, and I, you know, I kind of remember the stories of folks saying, you know, look to your left, look to your right. Uh, <laughs> they won't be here in the next semester. You know. And and you know, I didn't stay and go through. I still think I was in a growing up process. I was 16 when I got here. Right. And uh, but ultimately, I came back and finished uh, after working in the post office and those sorts of things. So when you were growing up, can you remember any negative experience that you had with the police? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and I have, growing up and continuing, yes, I had some negatives. Uh, we were on Elysian Fields and Claiborne, there were three or four of us. And the cops stopped us and asked us for our ID. You know, at that time, four black boys was a gang. Yeah. And so, um, you know, he looked at my whatever ID I gave him. I guess I may have. Yeah, I guess I had a driver's license. And he said, "You're 16. Where are you in school?" I said, uh, "LSU N O." And he said, "You're a smart nigga." And I said, "Smart, yes." The other cop said, "Leave that boy alone." Yeah, that was it. It just stopped you. Just stopped. Well, we were, to, we were walking to a party. We weren't doing anything. Yeah. It was just four, you know, black kids together, it was a gang. So do you think he was indirectly giving you a compliment? The fact that you were going to LSU, and which even by that time had a reputation for only smart people were able to stay there. Well, I don't know, I don't think he was paying me a compliment. Okay. Uh, you know, my age was what it was, right. and I wasn't in high school. And, and for whatever, he didn't tell say anything to anybody else after that, and, and the other police officer who was also white said, let those boys go. Yeah. And that was it. So, you came here, then you went to work in the post office. That's correct. Which was a good job. I think about that. I took the test, passed it, they kept offering me a job as a carrier. And I think what would have happened to my career if I had accepted 
which was one of the better paying jobs, at least, that you could get if you were black at that time. During our time, as females may have been school teachers, blacks had good jobs if they worked in a post office or if they worked on the riverfront. Right. Uh, I was married, had a child, had a good job in the post office, had the opportunity to bid and go to special delivery, which allowed me to return to college because I worked from 3 to 11. And there were no night classes or night schools back then. And then one day they called, well, one night, because I worked 3, 11, 9 o'clock, I go in. I think it's a Thursday night. And the uh, supervisor says, uh, Cage, you're being transferred to Harahan. I said, transfer? Yeah, this Saturday. I said, just for this Saturday? No, permanently. I said, there's special delivery in Harahan? No, you're going back as a letter carrier. I then asked, well, I get the seniority I had as a letter carrier before I bid on this job. No, you're going back to the bottom. And the last two words I said in the post office, uh, I'm sick. Hmm. And I left now. I had some terribly sleepless nights. You couldn't be, a, in our generation, be a married man with a child and not have a good job. And having a good job and quitting it right. is not an easy thing to do. but. I did, and I had some nightmares for a while until it all worked out. <laughs> okay. So what was it like when you came back? More matured? Oh, yeah. More for, responsibilities? Oh, more now? matured. But not, I was back before quitting the post office, taking class in, oh, okay. in the morning because I, I was working at night. Okay. And I was very serious about getting to the finish line. And then, of course, when it appeared it was going to stop. And, and I, look, I had some friends who even went to law school, but kept their jobs in the post office, okay? Yeah. Uh, and my intention was to go ahead and finish and then see what doors opened after that. But I quit. I got sick. Okay. And uh, then went on and finished here and then went to law school. So what made you decide you wanted to be a lawyer? Had that been in the back of your mind for a while? At St. Aug, I think I wanted to be a doctor, except I didn't like blood and, <laughs> and, and all the rest of that. And, and it, it seemed, after finishing, I'm looking for jobs and getting, and they really want jobs very honestly much better than the one I had in the post office. Okay. And so I had to do something else and uh, said, I'm going to I mean, did you have some lawyers that you knew that kind of at that helped time, steer you really, in that direction? I mean, I, I, I knew about some lawyers. I knew about Dutch. I knew about Earl Amity, but no. Okay. They, uh, nobody said, oh, Herb, go to law school. I just decided to do that. Well, and, you knew about A.P. Churro. Well, I mean, I knew about them, but you're talking about, I didn't know him. You didn't know him, okay. You know, I had met Dutch, had met Earl. Okay. Uh, Chuck Augustine, right. you know, uh, met him. But again, you know how it is when, you, when you're younger and they have achieved, and uh, I'm not sure that Chuck had become a judge then, but, you know, uh, from my perspective, at that time, they were way ahead of the game. When did you first get involved in the Civil Rights Movement? I kind of, there, there are a couple of things. I think I was involved, in, not actively involved, but involved in the sense of talking with others. And I, I think my real problem from not being really involved when I was you know, senior in high school, I was 15, 16 years old, and my mother was still very much in control. Well, and you, well, and she was, my, my stepdad was there then, but with the loss of my father, she could not stand me going to jail or me. Right. But you picked it with her son. Right. Yeah. Who was the person who influenced you to get involved? Well, there were well, a lot of folks. Rudy Lombard, uh, Keith Jones, you know. Llewellyn's son, yeah. L oh, Llewellyn, yeah. And <laughs> coincidentally, Llewellyn's son married as a cousin of mine later on. But Llewellyn I knew. I guess I knew from here. Here, I mean, from here, but knew was more in contact with Llewellyn. Yeah, yeah. He was really the person who recruited right black students to come here the first couple of years, and then decided to come. That's right. Got a degree, and he was supposed to go to law school himself, and, and he did. But got so much involved in the movement, he never did go. And and that was a, when I say a terribly interesting time uh, for this interview. I've never been arrested, but at some point was kind of ashamed of that because mm. I should have been arrested with the boycotting and everything yeah. else. 
and but was and I guess that's also partly lucky too. Well, I was arrested, and I remember growing up watching the Lone Ranger, and you see people in jail, and you can look out. Right. They sling a lot of doors behind you in jail. <laughs> so, you know, nobody correct. gets out unless you get some help. And, and the truth of the matter is, <laughs> the, the, the greatest factor for my avoiding that was my mother. My mother was like that too. But then right. I found out she was very proud of what we were doing. She was more afraid than actually opposed to what we were doing. Yes. And no. I think that was Well, true my mother so wasn't people. opposed. Yes. She just didn't want her son in jail getting beaten. I think the fact that she lost her husband at, at yeah. a very young age. My father was only 32. My mom must have been 28 or 29. Yeah. And um, I, I think and that had an impact. I was, at that time, she only had two children. I was the older of the two. And she devoted her life to... She was protective. Uh, that's very... And as she got older, there was one statement, me and my uh, youthful ignorance, she just kept bugging me. When are you going to finish college? When are you going to finish college? Yeah. And then one day, as I said in my youthful ignorance, I said, Mother, you only want me to finish college for your own selfish reasons. Yeah. And the first time I got sworn in as a judge, you reminded me of that. Yeah. Which was very important. Oh, very because important. You, uh, That's what a major success through yeah. the life of your children. That is correct. Yeah. And, and so you found that out as a parent. Yes, that's right. So you, you went to law school. Yes. And when you finished, you went to Southern Law School, right? Went to Southern Law School, uh, finished, took the bar, passed the bar the first time, and went to practice with a classmate of mine, Louis Gertis, that you mentioned yeah. earlier, and an alumnus of, of uh, LSU and O. And it's funny, people say, why do you say LSU and O? Because that's, that's where was. I finished and that's what it was and I never went to UNO. And, you know. I was I testified as an expert witness a couple of years ago before Judge Jackson in Baton Rouge. And after the lawyers had finished, I said, I got one question. You didn't go to UNO. Right. You went to LSU and O. When did they change the name? I said, I thought about it, February 1974. I said, okay. That's right. So I said, well, the same school, different names. Different names, that's right. But it was something special almost at that particular time. Well, I if think it came was. out here. Well, I, I think it was. Uh, you know, I, I met, and it's an interesting, for the first time I met some white folks, some of whom I'm still friends with today, yeah. some of whom are lawyers, yeah. uh, judges. Okay. And it's. Uh, it was an interesting occurrence. You know. Were there many whites in your class at Southern Law School? It, it, there were about seven to nine. That has changed oh, Lord, yeah. drastically now. It's so almost half is not majority if white. If not majority, right. Uh, but no, there, there were quite a few. Okay, right. even then. Even then. Okay. Well, that's it, seven or nine in the class, but in that year, there were only about 35 of us. How many uh, white faculty members at that time? Oh. Quite a few. It really? Was, yeah. Um, yeah, quite a few. The um, the dean from was Bahishma Agna Hotri in my last two years. Well, I didn't know he was there that that early. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> quite a few. Okay. My faculty members. So you went to work with Lou Gertis. Who else was in that office? Paul Valto. Paul Valto became civil sheriff. Class later. of what? Oh, Paul had to have been class of uh, around about 64, 65. 64, 65. Yeah. yeah, maybe 66. You know. So what was it like? Well, it was interesting. Let's see. You were on Sepinola then? Uh, no, no. On Elysian Fields. No, we, I was on. We were on Orleans. You still were in the Claver Building? I at the Claver Building, okay. we were there, and. Uh, you know, now you got to remember, Dutch was in that office. Right. Uh, the NAACP. Urban League was there. Was there Berlin at that the time. That's correct. And <clears throat> then from there, we moved to St. Bernard, and then I went on my own and went to Elysian Fields thereafter. But it was the kind of thing that, uh, as I felt, you know, the, the legal profession was just that, a profession. Okay. Not a hustle. And you got to, you live on your reputation. You could not advertise that. Right. Uh, the way you got business and representing folks was the represent. I mean, the the um, reputation that you had in the community, the person that you've been to others before becoming a lawyer, the manner in which you treat them and represent them gets you more clients. What kind of law do you specialize 
civil practice. Civil. Uh, when Dutch became mayor, I was I had the pleasure of serving the uh, Community Improvement Agency, and then it became New Orleans Redevelopment Authority for 20 some years. So I did a lot of property and real estate and expropriations of blighted properties. So then you moved out on your own. Yes. On Elysian Fields. That's correct. You were by yourself at first. No. I, uh, <laughs> quick, interesting story. Uh, it was Caden Jones. Uh, there are two Joneses. Okay. Dutch calls me, says, Herbert, Caden Jones, you know, Bob is an assistant city attorney. You got, you can't do that. I said, no, Judge. It's Herbert Cade and Charles Jones. Uh-huh. Uh, that wasn't quite right. I changed the stationery the next <laughs> day. <laughs> and, and Charles and I grew up together, and Charles was... Uh, you're behind me at St. Augustine, as you know, Charles went on to become a legislator right. and uh, a judge and retired as judge. That's right. Charles was in Alton's class. Yes. Alton Gasper. That is correct. Alton was my best man at my wedding. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. But you're behind me. And so for this interview, I just want the world to know Charles is older than me. He will see <laughs> this and be only four. Well, actually, years. he came here. Wow. Yeah. Well, then Very he fun. moved to Xavier. Well, he went. then he went to the military. Okay. I think. And then he went to Xavier. And then he worked for a while for Easton. I remember he That's, was. Uh, that is correct. I remember we got, going through his line a couple of times. All right. So you got involved in community activities, any political organizations? And, and that's another interesting story. Initially, I was recruited into Seoul. And in fact, the, the day I came home, a uh, neighbor came in knocked on my door, I know you finished law school, we want you in Seoul. That lasted for a little while because then Seoul split into Seoul and Roots <coughs> with Niels Douglas and those oh, yes. folks. And I, I became, forgotten about that. Yeah. And I became a member of Roots. And uh, What caused the split? I'm not quite sure I know. There was some internal fighting, of course. Okay. And I guess it was all about, you know, you had Chairman and Don with Soul. Right. You had Niels Douglas and others, Tom Jasper and other folks with Roots. And I think there was some split, if not over the candidate or if not over what exactly was going to happen. I think some folks... Uh, it might have been the Dutch, uh, and I'm trying to think. I think it might have been the gubernatorial election in 71. Okay. Because I know originally the plan was to uh, endorse uh, Bell. What's Bell's first name? Uh, I forgot his I, first I, name. I, I don't remember either. But uh, then they switched and supported Edmund Edwards. Correct. And I represented Roots in court, and it was like that issue was only about what they could put out, who could use the soul uh, insignia and all that sort of stuff. But it was over some internal fighting that okay. I really wasn't aware of, but very much involved in the political arena at that time. Was Roots mostly in 8th Ward as opposed to soul no. being ninth Ward? Or? It, well, it was Roots wanted to, and Roots didn't last all that long. Right. Roots, uh, and I'll tell you when I quit, <laughs> uh, I guess Roots wanted to be an equal to Seoul. Okay. I don't think that ever happened. But oh, and part, of, this part of the split was Dutch. I mean, because even after that, I left Roots because of who they endorsed in that race. Okay. And I wound up leaving the... But that's a really had life. Oh, yeah. Life was created during that time. Okay. I didn't become a member of life with all the people in life I knew. Okay. That's, I think Seoul endorsed Kiefer, right? That's correct. Matt okay. Kiefer. And all the other organizations, I, I know... I, Roots wanted to endorse Kiefer, too. Okay. And uh, that's when I left. Okay. Right. So, you became a part of which? Sort of independent. Okay. So, you, know, you didn't join any of the uh, political organizations? Oh, none of that. No. Okay. So how did you get elected without? Well, as I said, you know, uh, now very, the very first race that I ran, I lost. Okay, what Again, was that for? State Senate. Okay. Against my classmate, Lambert Bossier, okay. who had, uh, had been elected about 10 years or so before that. And there was several of us in the primary, and he and I were in the runoff, and 
my, my defense is he had been elected for many years long before I sought public office. And uh, but Lambert went on to serve as state senator after being a councilman, then as, as you know, he is still now the uh, constable. Council. Right. And he and I are friends. Good. Right. So at least there were what, four people out of your class who got into public office? You, Sherman, Lambert, and... Oh, that's more than that. In the row, in the <laughs> row, that first row, there were four elected officials. Lambert Bossier, Henry Braden, Herbert Cade, right. and Dennis Dinell. You're right, Sherman. Sherman got elected and was very much... So you were, you were seated alphabetically? Alphabetically. Who would have thought at that time? It was, it was not conceivable. There were no black elected officials. Right. And then to think, especially members of Skid Row, would leave in four of us in one row, there were only six or seven in a row, right. that four of us would hold uh, elective office. Um, no, that was not imaginable. Well, you had Nick Connors, who later went to the legislature. Did right. he have Nick any influence on you? Well, Nick, well, <laughs> Nick didn't teach us, or didn't okay. teach me, but no, I, I, I knew I thought he was a PE teacher. Well, he, that, yeah, but he, he didn't teach us. I don't okay. know if I took PE at St. Dog. Uh, no, but definitely an influence, and obviously now he became, this is through coup and all of that, when he became an elected uh, official state rep for that area. In fact, Havana Street, which is right behind right. St. Aug, is named after him now. Right. So you were not a member of life? No, not really. Okay. I, and I, I'm, I'm not <clears throat> quite sure why, but no, I was never, ever a But I'm trying to figure out how you got elected without being a member of one of the major political organizations. Well, again, it's like the practice of law. Okay. You build your reputation on who you've been throughout life. And if I remember stopping at Bullets one night and said, look, you know, Bullets is a block from Hardin Park. I played baseball there. I, I told them I played a ball a block away from here. I graduated a block away from here, and I've been in every ballroom on this street. But you, you, you meet people throughout life, and if you've been something that's not acceptable and you can't correct that, then, because it was the kind of time, you know, we didn't have that much money for advertising right. and stuff. It's, it's the person that you've been to others before becoming a professional lawyer, before becoming anything. It's the person that you've been throughout life. But then who supported you? In my initial run against Lambert, uh, Mark supported me. Okay. Um, Mark that, Morial? Mark Morial. Okay. And that was the divide again with uh, life and cool and all of that. Thereafter, I just went to folks when I ran for uh, civil district court, and that was in 2002. I just went to folks, but I had been a lawyer for a long time then, and again, mm -hmm. it's the kind of thing your reputation precedes you. Right. And so when I talked to folks, I talked to them as the kid they grew up with, the lawyer that represented them, the friend that was there if they needed one, and it worked. So which organization supported you then? That's it. No, Mark, Mark Morehill did not support me in that race. His, I ran against his uh, then city attorney. Um, Who was that? Mavis Early. Oh, yes. Right. I know. And, um, and I think it was just the two of us in that race because, uh, yeah, that was it. It was only one run at it. Uh, I had soul. I'm not sure I had bowl. May have had cool because of the split with the, you know, uh, memorials. Right. Um, and and it's kind of I really don't remember. I apologize. I could go back and look. Yeah, no. You know, but the idea is. Uh, but it's fascinating that you were without being grounded in any one. Right. No, I was not a, a member of an organization. That's correct. So you won. Yes. What was it like? Well, there I had, were a couple other blacks on the civil court by that time. Oh right? yeah, Mike Bagneris was there. Um, Kern had been there, I think, about maybe a year before me or something, a couple of years before me. Um, Lloyd Medley was there from St. Louis. Oh, that's right. Um, and you know? Yeah. Uh, Ron Ron was not there when he had left before I got had gotten there, but yeah. 
We, in fact, no, Ron was not there because when I got there, we used to uh, proudly state that all of the black male judges on CDC were graduates of St. Augustine's High School. How about that? All right. So how long did you stay on that court? Uh, from January 2003 until the last week of December 2011. And my only, I, I loved the court. Uh, the only reason I left was because I could, and, and Dennis sort of initiated that. He initially told me he was not going to run for re-election. He didn't tell me that he had he tried. Was Ill. He was ill. Yeah. And so he died in 2011. The election was held later that year. I ran that year and won that race and then had to run because that was only to finish his term and then ran the following year unopposed. What's the difference between the two? Well, <clears throat> civil district court is civil matters where you've resolved disputes amongst individuals or corporations uh, involving money or land disputes, that kind of stuff. Traffic court is People get citations, right. and uh, you know it's it's a different kind of court, a different kind of process. I, I, before the civil district court, I was fortunate enough to have been appointed to serve on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals back in 1987, and of course you, there you get an opportunity to review rulings of the trial judges, and so that was a great experience and then also was appointed to serve on juvenile court at various times throughout that. Uh, after serving at the Court of Appeals in 87, those judges recommended me and the Supreme Court again appointed me. I was the first African American to serve on the Judiciary Commission. Mm. What was that like? It was, it was first... Is that more disciplinary? Or? Well, it's, it's, it, it, it considers and makes, it makes recommendations to the Supreme Court, Louisiana Supreme Court, with complaints regarding complaints against sitting judges. Okay. And I guess in my naivete initially, I didn't think anybody would file a complaint against the judge. I was wrong. Really? Oh, yeah, they did. Now, at that time. What kind of complaints? Well, you know, unfairness, bias, uh, some conflict, something of that nature. And at that time, there weren't that many black judges, so there weren't so much complaints. I guess you only had Ortiz, Justice Johnson, and Chuck Augustine over, and well, Dutch had uh, left, left, right, uh, and and Chuck Augustine over at Criminal Court. That was pretty much it. And then, of course, later on, there, there were a great number of black judges. So were there a lot of complaints that were? There were a lot of complaints. I. I'd without say, merit, you say? Oh, there's, oh, there were a lot without merit, and for the most part, we. We dismissed them, but there were some with what we perceived to be merit and made certain recommendations to the Supreme Court relative to discipline. Now that was statewide? Statewide, yes. Okay. So it wasn't just Orleans? No, it was statewide. Right. What kind of relationships did you form with other judges? Did you have any, uh, were there any factors that related to your race when you first joined the court? Let me say this. The first place I served as a judge was the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Yes. I had the opportunity to meet some great judges who were white. Yes. Uh, judge Galata, I ultimately called him my stepdad. He was yeah. a great guy. He was the kind of guy who would first insult you regardless of your race, you know, uh, but was a very friendly guy. Uh, judge Siasio was there. Right. Judge Cleese was there. Jim Judge Jim Garrison was there. I had forgotten about him. Yeah, and what was he like? Very nice guy. You know, we had breakfast, we had lunch, but you know, he'd say, he would say, "Her about, can I use your phone? You know, mine is bugged." I said, "Of course, come on in," and I'd leave the room. And he still had that whole Kennedy assassination yeah. thing sort of haunted him. I, I told his daughter and his son here. A little strange, but all right, nice. And 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 I've had an opportunity. His son. His son or sons have appeared before me as lawyers when I was a judge, I guess on civil district court, and maybe every once in a while it might come to traffic court. So you didn't detect any bias? <clears throat> Look, it's a funny kind of thing, and, and I've got some good stories. There are some that I think had something to, to do with race, or maybe even 
location. I tried a case in a uh, home, I won't name the judge. My client thought I did a great job, and, but I was sure we lost. And the reason that I thought we lost may have not had anything to do with race. It had to be with the fact that everybody else was from Homa. Right. We were from New Orleans, and we couldn't vote in Homa. Right. Uh, and I think that was unfair. But I've had other great experiences in Covington, even in Plaquemine Parish. And I guess I went there with the... What were you doing? Oh, you mean as a lawyer? As a lawyer. Okay. Yeah, and, and you know, trying cases there. Uh, no problem with judges? And, and I, I got to tell you this story. And unfortunately, the, the, the judge is now deceased, uh, and I'll use his name, but this is a true story. Judge A. Clayton James in Covington, St. Tammany Parish. I went there to try a case uh, to set aside a tax sale. My clients had purchased eight acres of land in Slidell, but the tax, they did. The taxes were not paid, I think, for seven, 1971 and 1972, and the law was clear then, you know, you had to pay your taxes. Right. You had automatically a three-year right of redemption. Right. If there was a problem with the tax sale, you had a five-year peremptory period, and unless you could show that there was something with the tax sale and you continually incorporate co uh, continuous corporeal possession, then you can attack the tax sale because you stayed on the land, continued to own the land. And the judge was A. Clayton James who ruled in, in our favor and he asked that we come into, uh, not my clients, me and the other lawyer, to come in his chambers and, you know, he congratulated me and all that sort of stuff. Then he said, uh, Mr. Cade, I bet you thought that the judges in St. Tammany all wore white robes. Mm -hmm. I was shocked. Yeah. He says, well, I said, Judge, you want me to answer that? <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, maybe I had some fear. He says, well, obviously this judge wears a black robe. Wow. And you know, and look when I tell folks that, I mean, it's a, it happened. I didn't ask for that. Right. You know, uh, the first time I had a, a case in Plaquemine Parish, and I think if, in our day you say Plaquemine, we say Leander Perez. Right. And we go in, and the judge says, this is a personal injury case, and well, Mr. K, K, do you have any cases that would cite how much this is worth? Well, I knew then I've won, when I say won, I've won the liability. Right. And I gave him a, a case and pretty much on point with the length of treatment and stuff. And the lawyer says, well, Judge, you know, da, 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 da. And he says, I agree with Mr. K. Damn, I was shocked again. Right. But it's a matter of fairness. Right. Nobody was doing any favor. Nobody was trying to get black votes. It's a matter of just following the law and the evidence. You have many white clients when you were practicing? It changed. Okay. The more black judges there were, right. the more white clients wow. you got. The percept well, you gotta remember, let's go back to our early years. You know, you had Algonquin, Jay Calhoun and that kind of perception. I believe black folks thought that they were better represented by white lawyers because right. the judges were white. Right. And then after that change, obviously the business picked up. Now, there weren't that many black lawyers back then. That right. has since changed. At one time, we knew every black lawyer in the oh, state. Right. <laughs> that that is few. absolutely correct. But that's no longer the case. I don't know every black lawyer in the city of New Orleans or Orleans, in Orleans Parish or right. Jefferson. I mean, just too many. But that changed. And, of course, everybody, want, when they go to court, they want a good legal mind. But also, if they think that their lawyer has some way or weight with the judge, you know, that, ha that happens. No, that's part of the way it works. That's right. That's why networking is so important. That's correct. And you got to understand initially, there was no advertising. Right. You know. That changed when, in the 90s? Uh, I forgot, uh, I used to teach that case. Right. Uh, the, the guy here, I guess, for the, initially was Morris Bart. Morris Bart is one of my students. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think he was the first one here, but somebody else won a case outside. Okay. I remember, which uh, would set that aside. Chief uh, Justice Berger railing against the lawyers advertising like they were selling more, uh, melons and sausage. <laughs> yeah, well, watch TV in the morning. There are lots of commercials. I think the uh, the, the stations want that. They, uh, yeah, it works. That, it, it works, right. Were there any disappointments that you had in the profession? There have been some rulings. I thought it was simply either purely politically or racially based, 
but I can't say that for certain. Okay. You know. But, I mean, personal disappointments, things that you perhaps thought that you could have had an impact upon and looking back, it didn't happen. You know, it's, it's funny. If you look at my, my legal career and the things that happened, I've been very, very fortunate. Um, I lost my first race. I was disappointed about that. But that was I, the only one you lost? Yeah. Well. Oh. And then I was against a guy, I went to, yeah, a guy I went to St. Aug with for four years who said two seats or three seats in front of me, so I couldn't be too upset about that. You terms. remain friends, huh? Oh, of course. Okay. Of course. Absolutely. And again, it's, it's that reflection back on St. Aug. You know. yeah. If it wasn't St. Aug, he couldn't have beat me. I'm too kidding, of course. But it's, it's uh, you know, I guess in, in terms of disappointments or I guess you, you wish you'd have made more money. Sometimes you wish you'd have help some other people. There have been lawyers and friends that I've met that have had problems along the way that I wish I could have helped more. Yeah. You know, but it's part of life. Oh, are you active with St. Augs Alumni Association? Not as much as I used to be there. Um, and every time I say that and I meet with the guys and I say we're going to get back and then we find out that there's still some sort of uh, discord or disagreement. Is Paul still the alumni director? No. Okay. No. So he's retired? Yes. Okay. Yes. I used to see him all the time at Little Disney. I haven't seen him in a, well, I mean, he's a still, year. Right, but he's still, he's still out and about, okay. and we talk about that all the time. Uh, and, of course, with Lambert and uh, Dwight McKenna, who was you know, before me at St. Aug. Dwight was 58. Right. He was the year before I graduated. Right. And his first cousin was one of those people in my class from uh, Jones, Frederick, St. Oh, Warren McKenna, the uh, ophthalmologist. Right. right. So, what do you think about the future of the city of New Orleans? We're coming up on our tricentennial in a couple of years. I would hope uh, that things get better, but as I say that about New Orleans, I've got to look at the, the United States and this presidential situation is not good. I think New Orleans is on a a good foot. I think things will improve. I think our involvement, the biggest problem we have is the crime issue. Big problem. And, and, and your old neighborhood. Oh yeah. It's not the neighborhood I grew up no. in. And, and you know, it's changing. It's, I make this statement and people say they agree with me. When we were kids, I li we lived through segregation. Right. But we lived in integrated neighborhoods. Right. Then integration passed, right. and all the neighborhoods were segregated. Right. It's hard to explain that, but that's what happened. No, I live in a neighborhood that was about 60% poor, working-class whites, right. who many of them were poorer than we were. That's correct. And then integration came, and they weren't there anymore. And I wasn't aware of it until later that the slow exodus after 1954, after the Brown ruling. Right. I didn't realize it at that particular time, but that had a lot to do with People moving out. I live in the Lower Ninth Ward into St. Bernard Parish. Correct. And the crazy part about it was how people accommodated segregation. I talked about the, my mother going to town, as they called it, with right. one of the white neighbors. And they're talking at the bus stop. Get on the bus. That's right. White woman is in front of the screen. My mother is back. And I don't think they ever thought about how how crazy that was. But it was so usual. Well, it's it's what we accepted. Yeah. You know. Um, it was part of life. It was wrong, and obviously that changed over the course of years, but I, New Orleans is a different kind of place, too. It is. Um, there is, with the uh, Creole community, there's a kind of kinship that maybe did, doesn't exist yeah. in other places. Uh, and of course, that also causes some divide in the black community. Mm -hmm. you know, I think that has changed. I'm not so sure that New Orleans is that divided, or yeah. as divided as, as as it was before. But it's, uh, you know, it is what it was. But now. it was home. It was home. And you know, everybody knew your neighborhood. I remember mentioning that uh, passing through the neighborhood. I didn't know this guy knew me. Cas, where are you going? Right. <laughs> when I got home. He had called my parents to tell me he had seen me. Right. 
We don't have that kind of no, we accountability had, anymore. Right. When we talk about takes a village, we had a community. You had to speak to every everybody, black ep, and white. Black and white. If you didn't, your mom knew when you got home. You didn't speak to Miss So and So. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't see her. You yeah. know that kind of thing. And then that changed, uh, changed drastically. We like to talk about. Or no, I do. I walked this entire city. All right. Now, I most probably didn't walk to the lower nine, but I went to the ninth ward, right. uptown, walked right. everywhere. I wouldn't walk a block today at night if I was going to a bar or going to some function, only because it's a, it's a different world. That part of it bothers Very me. Very different. Right. Well, a lot of the old homes, seventh, eighth, and ninth wards, people just abandoned. I mean, good right. homes, city homes. That's and correct. Something happened. That sense of community. I remember we dedicated A.P. Tiro's house, and right next to it is a house too that's fallen down. Oh, right, that's correct. It's it's a strange kind of thing. I'm not quite sure what happens now. I think you see those same neighborhoods, which are crime infested. There are folks moving in, walking their dogs, riding their bikes, and they're not bothered by it. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure why. You know, and that's something that we need to deal with in our own community. In the sense that when I say community, the black community, I don't understand it. it, it during our time, it was not anywhere like it is no. now. No. No, yeah, I, you're right. I could walk almost any place. Sure. Didn't have a car. Cause my parents were middle aged when we finally got our first car. Mm -hmm. My daddy never did drive. I got it. My daddy drove, uh, caught the bus. He had an umbrella. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. In case it rained, if it got too bad, he'd catch a cab. You could right. do that. Right. But you're right, I don't even walk through my own neighborhood. And that's a shame, but that's that's the way it is now. That's the environment we live yeah. in, and that's uh, and that's, that has to be addressed. I saw on TV the other day that, and it looked like there were just uh, people of the Muslim faith who were passing out cards trying to be peacekeepers. Yes. If there's a problem, let's talk. Maybe we can bring you in and talk with your the person you have a problem with. I think we're going to have to address that because just simply, you know, black on black crimes is not acceptable and really doesn't make sense. We understand that some folks are impoverished. As a judge, I've had and at some point had a domestic docket, and you find kids who simply don't have a way in life. Yeah. You know, when, when I used to ask kids, because on my way to law school the summer before, I went out and worked as a deputy sheriff in, in uh, Orleans Parish Prison. There were some friends of mine that were there. And I just couldn't understand how three hots and a cot yeah. was acceptable right. as a future. Right. And of course, if you never had, if you didn't know if you were going to eat, what you were going to eat, what you were going to do, where you were going to sleep, luckily for me, that was never an issue for right. me. But if, in fact, that was an issue, might be acceptable to get three hots in a car. Hey, how long are y'all gonna lock me up? Six months? Okay, that's fine. But it's been exacerbated since Katrina. I mean, the oh, number of right. homeless that's correct. teenagers and people in their young 20s who didn't have any homes to come back to. to that's correct. And that's the thing that's so sad about that. Yeah, and when I tell younger folks the number of homeless people of whatever race we see now, that did not exist. No. Not, did not exist. No. And when I'm, you hear about a whole boy, there's somebody who, by choice. By choice. You know, he's hopping a train <laughs> right. to go from one city to another. What the Which heck? I used to think was kind of exciting. Right, right. As opposed to a a, sta a, a, a state of life, I just can't understand it. Well, I experienced it during Katrina. I remember after Katrina, I had money in the bank, but didn't have a home. That is a strange feeling. At least I knew I was going to get back. It took two and a half years before we got back into our house. But okay. a strange feeling not to have a home. That is very strange, but your, even your predicament was different than those it folks. It is, yeah. You know. With no to hope. Yeah, right. And that's, you know, my house got, I lived on the West Bank, my house got messed up. I opted to live in my garage okay. for almost a year rather than in a trailer. Right. All right. And then the truth of the matter is I had a refrigerator, air conditioning, microwave, so, and television. So it really wasn't that bad, but uh, it wasn't the entire house. <clears throat> but for a lot of folks, it was truly being displaced. Right. For some folks, it worked out well because they went out to other places and found a new life. My daughter and her family, my granddaughter, that's the biggest loss I had. My granddaughter was four. 
I used to pick up from nursery. She's 15 now. Oh, She's growing up in Houston. Done very well. The schools are so much better. I heard that. I Probably was in Houston. Probably cheaper. Right. I, I, my, my, the third, my mom's third child, my sister, lives in Houston, and that's where we spent the time until we could return to come back. And Houston is huge. Right. And I'm not so sure that I, I liked it compared to New Orleans where I knew everything. I knew right. every place. I knew where to go, not to go. And as opposed to uh, Houston, I had no idea and was just there and felt like I was truly a visitor. But it grew on us. Yeah. People could not have been nice. In fact, we right. kept the apartment for, I think, three and a half years. Okay. When I retired, I was still commuting between here and New Orleans. So what was it like when you had to come back? You didn't have a, a home in the well, sense that you had before. Right, no, we had to have it uh, repaired. No, I mean, when you you were still a judge. Yes. So oh, were well, you holding court? Well, we held court in Baton Rouge, okay. in Gonzales. So uh, how was that? Different, and it was, you know, it was the kind of thing, fortunately, the, the state paid us uh, and, and our employees but it was a situation where, un unfortunately, it wasn't the same kind of thing. And the court was truly disrupted until January of uh, 2006. Okay. So and, well, it didn't take that long then to come Well, back. no, we came, that's right. We came back January 2006 to be back at civil district court. I understand traffic court was across the river at the Algiers courthouse for some time. I wasn't there then, so I'm not quite sure how long. And, and it was different. The city, as you well know, in 2006 had not fully recovered. Long ways. <laughs> right. And so uh, uh, it was different. Well, you, uh, most of the cases were related to the lawsuits against the hurricane? At that, not, not when we first got back. Okay. A lot of them were after that, a lot of insurance cases. And, you know, it was different. But when I tell people, of course, you know, when you get to be our age and you tell folks, the term evacuate was not in our vocabulary. No, we'd ride out the stones. That's First right. time I ever left. That's correct. I, what happened, my parents were older and still living. I left the year before Katrina. Right. And we came back the next day. Right. All right. And thought we were going to do that for Katrina. It didn't happen. My parents stayed away over a year and something in, in Houston. Uh, and a lot of things just changed. The, the neighborhood that I grew up in where my parents still lived at the time had changed. Right. Uh, not all of the people were back. Things were looked scary for the first time. It didn't look scary to me before, but it looked scary then. It was very scary. I remember we had to come back on campus in January 2006 between uh, Chef and oh, yeah. UNO Passendilla. There was not a single light. I drove back to St. Anthony. There was not a single light until I got to uh, Leon C. Simon. Wow. That was strange. And now, of course, that was very strange, and the city looked frightening. Yeah. You know, purely frightening. Uh, I think we, we did do a fine recovery, ultimately, but for our communities that we understood, that we grew up in, mm -hmm. that we lived in, I'm not sure that they have returned as such. No, there's still pockets, but right. again, considering the extent of the devastation, there's been a lot of recovery. Yeah. yeah. If you had a home, my home is better than it was before Katrina. Okay. For a lot of people, did better. Uh, unfortunately, for a lot of people, we're renting. Yeah. There's not much future because I'd like to get back, so there's nothing here for you. You're much better off. The jobs pay more money. The houses are much cheaper. Public schools are so much better. So yeah. stay there. You can get red beans and rice. <laughs> I mean, that was one of the biggest complaints. We, right. No camellia beans, no sherry sausage. But they started importing it in, and it yeah. got better. Well, it's, it's a funny kind of thing, and that's what I, when I talk to younger kids and we talk about ignorance. I remember the first time I traveled, this was long before the hurricane, and went someplace and just asked for grits. Ah. Uh -huh. Grits. <laughs> and, you know, well, grits. And you learn that what you believe to be universal isn't. Definitely not. I went to Los Angeles while in high school and talked about neutral grounds. Neutral grounds. They're talking about medians. Right. You know, so it's part of the process. I remember in Boston asking for a, a milkshake <laughs> and say, from somebody finding, oh, a frap. Right. And I asked for a, a shrimp sandwich and I got scallops. 
I mean, well, that's bad. They're not the same as shrimp, but no. you, you find out the, the world lives differently, and you can adjust if you have some flexibility. And, and that's why I think now we live in, because of television and the social media, we live in a more universal world. Than, I mean, I, if you didn't travel there, you didn't see it. No. You didn't experience it. Now it's a little different. You get that children, people have that opportunity. Well, that's one of the best things. We've imported our culture. That's <laughs> we brought that's correct. real gumbo to yeah. other places that had never experienced it before. And they got a chance to get authentic poor boys when you brought in real bread. That's right. So it wasn't all a loss. No, I don't think so. And then, of course, for, for people, when you find out and experience other societies, other communities, other places, that yours is just not the totality of how people exist, and then they begin to appreciate your culture, your food, what you do, your language. And I would not, at one point, I'm sure, by the time I was 13 or 14, I thought English was English. Yeah. Not quite. No. No. <laughs> not the way it's spoken in other places. Places, that's correct. One last question. Sure. What would you, what advice would you give to young people today who are thinking about the legal profession as a career? Black or white? Right. I young think or old? If you're truly dedicated to trying to help others, and you're going to dedicate yourself to knowing the law, because, you know, in each case it's a matter of what the facts are. The law really doesn't change, and when you think the law is wrong, make every effort to change it for the better. Now, of course, you've got to learn that process, too. But as a litigator, I think if you start with a, the right reason, for the most part, you're going to wind up with the right result. But you've got to be dedicated to that cause. So there has to be some dedication involved. It's not just making a living. Oh, no. I mean, and if that's it, find something better to do because, you know, this can be at some times uh, very distressing. And now with the, the greater number of lawyers that we right. have, you know, getting if you're going to put out your own shingle, you may starve to death. And, you know, there are a lot of folks who've been depressed by this profession. Now, if you get a job with a big law firm and prepare to work uh, 12, 14 hours every day, then, then fine. But then that becomes a problem, too. Networking is important. That's how oh, you get into a absolutely. law firm. That's networking is, and again, it's all about your reputation, and, and when I, it's not just your reputation in the classroom, it's the person that you've been, whether or not people talk to you and feel like you're trustworthy, that you're believable. Well, at the, very, at the very least, you believe in what you are saying, as opposed to some of our politicians today who just say, whatever. One final question, how well did you and know, prepare you for this career? UNO, no, I didn't go to UNO. LSU and O. <laughs> LSU and O prepared me. It's a great school. It was, it was a continuation for me of the St. Arthur. Right. You know, uh, that was the first time though I had been in the class with that many people and the professor says, look to your left, look to your right. Two of you won't be here next semester. My God. But it was the kind of thing that was challenging. And <clears throat> I think for, for me, it came at a time initially in my early life where I was still trying to grow up. I didn't want to go home and read books all night. But it's the kind of thing that I also told you if you pass this course, you can pass other courses and go on to be fairly successful in your future life. So it gave you that confidence when you well, went to law school? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it was the kind of thing that you read it, you know it, you answer the question, you continue that when you go to law school because that's what it's about. Judge Kidd, thank you so much. Good seeing you, Doc. All right. We don't see each other enough.